Good afternoon, everyone. I think we'll get started now. Uh, the numbers are going up all the time, but I think we don't want to delay. Uh, welcome to the second of two webinars hosted by Radcliffe Chambers on the new Corporate Insolvency and Governance Bill. It's a bill which, as I'm sure you've read, is widely regarded as one of the most significant reforms to the UK insolvency law since the introduction of administrations, uh, which is back in 2003. Um, having passed through the Commons on the 3rd of this month, the Bill has had its second reading in the Lords already. It will now move to the committee stage in the Lords, uh, I believe on the 16th of this month, and it will then have its third reading there on the 23rd. So it looks like it's going to be on the statute book very soon, possibly even by the end of the month. Exciting stuff for us insolvency lawyers. Um, in our first seminar last week, we looked at the new moratorium and the restructuring procedures in the bill. The presentations highlighted some interesting and rather underappreciated points about the drafting of the bill, particularly about the application of the moratorium, which some of us are still debating today. Um, this week, we're going to focus on the temporary COVID provisions uh, and also on the new provisions uh, for supply contracts. Uh, as with last week, uh, the format of today will be in two parts. First, we're going to hear two short presentations on the temporary COVID provisions from Katie Longstaff and Ruben Comiskey. Ruben's going to concentrate on the temporary suspension of wrongful trading, and Katie will take you through everything else. James Morgan will then chair a Q&A session to tie that bit of the bill up. Then we're going to hear two shorter presentations on the new supply contract provisions. Uh, Lauren Prima will give you an overview of the new provisions and then Matt Weaver will look at some of the uncertainties and the problems that are raised. I'm then going to chair a short question and answer session and then James will wrap the session up. I think that's just about all I need to say by way of introduction. Um, I do hope that you find this session informative and practical. Thank you very much for everyone who wrote in after the last session. Uh, and if you'd like to do so again, please do so. Um, like last week, if you've got any question that you'd like to ask, please use the button at the bottom of your screen and someone, one of us, will try and answer it if we have time. Also, to help you follow the presentations, you should have received some slides. We're not gonna put them up on the screen um, so you can have full visibility of the speaker, but uh, it might be helpful if you have them to hand. All right, our first speaker is going to be Katie. Katie, can I ask you to switch on your microphone and give your presentation, please? Uh, of course, all the other hosts will now switch off their microphones if they have them on. Katie, over to you. Thank you, Chris. So I'm looking at the temporary measures uh, set out in the bill. And as you'll know, these are intended to give businesses the best opportunity to survive the immediate pressures that are presented by the pandemic. Um, I'm going to consider the measures fairly briefly and flag some of the issues that we've identified with them along the way. Um, they're broadly categorised into five groups. Uh, the temporary modifications to the new moratorium, statutory demands, winding up petitions and orders, meetings and filing requirements, the power to amend legislation and also uh, the provisions around wrongful trading, which Ruben is going to deal with separately. So, Let's look first then at the temporary modifications to the new moratorium. So as we heard last week from Kate and Adam, the purpose of this moratorium is to give directors a breathing space, hopefully to rescue eligible companies as going concerns. And for a temporary period, the criteria for obtaining a moratorium are relaxed. Now, this period starts when Schedule 4 to the bill comes into force. Uh, and continues until the 30th of September of this year. During this time, an eligible company that is subject to a winding up petition can actually obtain the moratorium by simply filing the relevant documents. So uh, the directors would not have to make a court application. And even if the company has been subject to a moratorium or an insolvency procedure in the 12 months leading up to uh, the filing, the company is still eligible. So what it does, it effectively extends the protection to more companies for a limited time. Also to note is during this temporary period, the monitor is to disregard any worsening of the company's financial position due to the coronavirus. 
Now, it, it strikes me that it might be quite difficult to strip out uh, the coronavirus impacts. And we heard from Kate last week that the Monitor may be heavily reliant on the information that the directors uh, will produce. And so there's a risk at least that directors knowingly or unknowingly could exaggerate the impact that COVID would have on the business. And one would hope that any risk of abuse in, in this case um, would be militated against by the various offences that are introduced um, as to the moratorium. So turning then to uh, statutory demands, winding up petitions and winding up orders. Well, when the bill comes into effect, it's going to be much harder to obtain a winding up order off the back of a winding up petition that was presented during the relevant period. And in fact, it's going to be impossible to obtain a winding up order in relation, solely in relation to a statutory demand that was served during that period. The relevant period in this context runs from the 1st of March to the 30th of September and the statutory demand blanket ban applies even if the company is experiencing financial difficulties that have nothing to do with COVID-19. In fact the intended blanket ban was a crucial point in a very recent case, Rio Company, which was heard just at the beginning of this month um, in which Mr Justice Morgan granted an injunction restraining the presentation of a petition that was based on a statutory demand that was served in what will be the relevant period. So at first blush, petitioners might think they can circumvent these issues by simply presenting their petition on other grounds. So under section 1231E or 12312, or 123, sorry, 1232. But as I've already alluded to, there are other hurdles that the petitioners will be facing. Um, what I'm going to do is outline these provisions and then we can specifically deal with some of the issues that um, we've identified in respect of them. So in respect of winding up petitions, a petitioner cannot present a winding up petition during the relevant period unless certain conditions are met. And that is that the, the creditor has reasonable grounds for believing that coronavirus has not had a financial impact on the company. And if it has, that the debt issues would have arisen in any event. For petitions that are presented on or after the 27th of April, but before uh, the schedule comes into force, that is schedule 10, and the conditions are not met, the court has a power to order that, um, or make orders that restore the position as it was for the company before the petition was presented. As to the winding up orders, um, the court cannot make a winding up order where the petition was presented during the relevant period um, unless it's satisfied that the financial issues would have aris arisen despite coronavirus. And there is some respective effect as well. If uh, the winding up order was made on or after the 27th of April, but before Schedule 10 comes into force, the petition, um, the, the order cannot be uh, made well effectively is void uh, because um, the the courts would not have made that order in other circumstances sorry that is if uh, the conditions were not satisfied so in that scenario the court may give directions to the official receiver or the liquidator again restoring the position to what it would have been in before the petition was presented so this of course presents a variety of questions and one um, key issue is obviously the burden of proof. Who bears the burden of satisfying the court that the petitioner had reasonable grounds for making the petition? Who bears the burden uh, to show that the company's financial difficulties would have arisen despite coronavirus? Well, it appears that the burden would rest with the petitioner to show it had reasonable grounds. It is, of course, the petitioner's petition. And the bill itself requires the petition to include a statement that the petitioner considers the conditions are met. The drafting of the bill doesn't suggest otherwise, but so far as the burden of proof um, lies at the petition hearing itself, it's less clear. And in fact, the government guidance that has been provided alongside the bill goes as far as stating that the petitioner has to demonstrate the company's inability to pay its debts was not caused by the pandemic. Now, one may think that this is obviously problematic for a petitioner as the company in all likelihood is going to have the relevant information, whereas the petitioner probably won't. Um, in contrast, it may be comparatively easy 
for a company to challenge petitions, especially if the debt is relatively recent or if the company um, trades in an area that has been particularly hard hit by the virus, um, for instance, the hospitality sector. Further issues um, surround the restorative orders and directions that are proposed. The language of the bill suggests that the court will have a discretion as to uh, whether to make these orders and directions. So I'd query then, how is the court to exercise this discretion? And the wide drafting of the bill itself would appear to permit a range of orders being made. So these would go beyond a simple set aside, strike out orders and determinations in respect of fees and costs orders. That said, for a winding up order that is made off the back of a petition that is presented during the relevant period, uh, the winding up is deemed to commence on the date of the order itself. So this may negate some of the need for restorative orders in some cases. You might also uh, be wondering what impact will this have on liquidators appointed in relation to winding up orders that are made on or after the 27th of April, but before the bill uh, comes into force, where there is some uncertainty as to whether the requisite conditions have been met. Well, it seems to me that a liquidator may be inclined to hold off with substantive work until the court makes a determination. Uh, some proactive office holders may even seek directions from the court as to the validity of the order. And of course, that would give rise to cost consequences and delays as well. There's two for further points to note in respect of this temporary measure. Um, firstly, there are obligations placed on official receivers. So if it appears to an official receiver that a petitioner has not complied with the requisite conditions or a winding up order um, is in fact void, the OR must refer that matter to court. And that reference is to be treated uh, like an application for a stay under section 147 of the Insolvency Act. So again, that could um, lead to further costs for those parties that are actively involved in that. And a final point on this, uh, there are other changes proposed to related rules to give effect to this temporary measure. For instance, a petitioner will have to hold off on advertising the petitions until the court has determined whether it's likely to make uh, a winding up order. So that appears to introduce a preliminary determination. It's not clear when that would be made, uh, but what it does make clear is that a petitioner can expect further delays before um, it can proceed with its petition. So there's a lot in there to put petitioners off petitioning before the 30th of September. Um, I'm going to touch on meetings and filing requirements. Uh, as to meetings, the bill relaxes the rules for meetings to be held by companies and other qualifying bodies. This is to have retrospective effect. Um, so we'll run from the 26th of March to the 30th of September. Um, it provides that general meetings can be held remotely. Shareholders can exercise their rem uh, rights remotely as well. And that is so even if the company's constitution doesn't provide for it. Uh, it's also worth flagging that these provisions do not apply to uh, meetings of creditors in an insolvency process. So it's still possible for creditors to requisition a physical meeting, um, but it's very unlikely in the circumstances and one would expect an office holder to seek directions from the court to uh, have a meeting held in other ways. Um, as to filing deadlines, the bill also provides for temporary extensions uh, for filing accounts with public companies and there is um, a power there for regulations to be made to extend the deadlines for certain filings um, of other documents, including annual confirmation statements. Um, of course, this will impact on the accuracy of the information contained on the company register, so that will have disadvantages for those of us that rely on the information there. And finally, before I turn to Ruben um, dealing with wrongful trading, it's worth noting that the bill empowers the Secretary of State to make regulations to change a range of corporate insolvency legislation. That includes, but it's not limited to, the corporate provisions of the Insolvency Act, uh, Part 26A of the Companies Act. Uh, this bill, including the temporary provisions, which I've referred to, and any other subordinate legislation in relation to the relevant acts. The government has said at the moment it has no plans to make any legislation in respect um, of this provision, 
um, but it could give rise to significant, albeit short term, uh, changes to this area of law. Um, and it's therefore some comfort at least to note that there are various protective limitations on the way in which these regulations can be brought into force and there is a long stop date of the 30th of April uh, 2021 and after that those regulations uh, cannot be made. Um, thank you very much Sorry, for getting through all that material so efficiently. Uh, we'll now move to Ruben and the temporary wrongful trading provisions. Thank you James. Um, today has been billed as a look at the temporary COVID-19 provisions and the wrongful trading provisions have been widely described as temporary. But as we will see, in important respects, they're actually permanent and potentially troublesome. But first, it might be useful background to look at the law, at the law as it stands without those provisions. Now, subsection 2141 of the Insolvency Act sets out the court's powers where it has found somebody liable for wrongful trading. Subject to subsection 3, which deals with a defence and is not important for present purposes, if the court finds that the test for liability contained at subsection 2 is satisfied in relation to a person, then the court may declare that that person is to be liable to make such contribution, if any, to the company's assets as the court may think fit. Mm -hmm. We will come to subsection 2 in a moment, but before we do, it's useful to note the last words of subsection one. They give the court a seemingly unfettered discretion as to how to calculate the compensation payable if wrongful trading is proved. However, that discretion has been significantly cut down by the authorities, as we shall see. Subsection 2142 of the Insolvency Act deals with liability. It sets out three criteria which must be satisfied in relation to a person, and which, if satisfied, give rise to the discretion referred to as subsection one. The first is that the company's gone into insolvent liquidation. Section 246ZB of the Insolvency Act contains an equivalent provision for administration. The third is that the person was a director of the company at the relevant time. The second is the important one for present purposes. Subsection 2B says that it is necessary that at some time prior to commencement of the winding up of the company, that person knew or ought to have concluded there was no reasonable prospect that the company would avoid going into insolvent liquidation or entering insolvent administration. So it's clear that what the wrongful trading provisions do not do is to penalise trading whilst insolvent. It's perfectly possible, in fact common, for a company to be temporarily insolvent on either or both of the balance sheet and cash flow bases and yet return to solvency. There's nothing wrong if directors take the view that this is likely to happen and continue to trade, providing they act reasonably. On the contrary, in many cases, it will be in the interest of creditors for the company to trade out of difficulty if possible. And in these circumstances, the directors ought to be acting in the best interests of the creditors anyway. No, what is penalised by wrongful trading provisions is continuing to trade once the point of no return has been reached, and once that fact ought to have been recognised. Now, moving on to how the quantum of the contribution to the company's assets is to be fixed. In Continental Assurance, uh, Mr Justice Park said that the maximum quantum of liability is the increase in net deficiency, which in his view reflected the loss to the company itself as a result of liquidation being delayed. In so doing, he rejected a measure based on the unpaid creditor claims dating from after the point of no return. What this requires in practice is an estimated net deficiency statement to be produced for a hypothetical liquidation commencing on the date on which trading ought to have ceased which must then be compared with an estimated net deficiency statement for the actual liquidation. The measure of loss is, subject to causation issues, the difference between the two. And causation is important. Later in the same judgment, Mr Justice Park set out an important caveat to his test when he said, there must, in my view, be more than a mere but-for nexus of that type to connect the wrongfulness of the director's conduct with the company's losses which the liquidator wishes to recover from them. In saying that, he was relying on an earlier decision of Hazel Williamson QC, re Brian D. Pearson Contractors Limited, in which she did not order the whole of the increased net deficiency payable by the director of a golf course construction company because its business had suffered from exceptionally bad weather. She said, I'm not satisfied that the full extent of the worsening of the position of the company is to be attributed to the continued trading of the company. This is applying a but-for test of causation, 
I accept from Mr. Pearson's evidence that the eventual position of the company owed something to losses caused by particularly bad weather conditions of 1994 to 95. Whilst the wrongful trading may have provided the opportunity for those losses, it could not be said to have caused them. And the similarity with the present situation is obvious. Now, turning to the bill itself, Article 10.1 says that in determining for the purposes of uh, Section 214 or to Section 246ZB of the Insolvency Act, um, the contribution, if any, to a company's assets that it's proper for a person to make, the court is to assume that the person is not responsible for any worsening of the financial position of the company or its creditors that occurs during the relevant period. The relevant period is between the 1st of March and the 30th of September 2020, or well, that's what we think it's going to be at the moment. Now, it's interesting to have a look at this point, at what has been said in Parliament about this provision. Introducing the bill on the 3rd of June 2020, Alok Sharma, the Business Secretary, said, wrongful trading is an important deterrent against company directors continuing to trade when the company is insolvent, and when doing so increases the losses to creditors. Directors can be made personally liable as a result. However, during this difficult period, many otherwise viable companies may become technically insolvent, particularly if they have been severely affected by a drop in demand caused by COVID-19. This measure, the wrongful trading suspension, as, they, as he called it, uh, gives company directors the confidence to use their best efforts to continue trading without the threat of personal liability, should the company ultimately go into an insolvency. As we shall see, in my view, almost everything Mr Sharma said was wrong. In response, Ed Miliband agreed. The suspension of personal liability for wrongful trading whilst insolvent makes sense as a measure. It was left to Jonathan Ginogli to point out one of the problems here when he asked, will directors get any benefit from the wrongful trading proposals knowing that they could be in breach of other directors' duties and that these proposals were only temporary so that they will could well need to justify their decision to trade on at a later date in any event. And the government's response from Paul Scully was to say that temporarily removing the threat of personal liability for wrongful trading for, from directors who try to keep their companies afloat throughout this emergency will encourage directors to continue to use their best efforts to trade during this uncertain time. But he added that there will be, although there will be a temporary suspension of wrongful trading liability, directors will still have legal duties under wider company law. So what's the effect of this new provision? Well, on one view, the new provision does absolutely nothing. The courts already take into account extraneous events when determining liability for wrongful trading, and it would be astonishing if they did otherwise in relation to COVID-19. Unfortunately, however, it's not strictly true that the new provision does nothing. What it does is to create what is, in my view, an irrebuttable presumption that financial losses made during the relevant period were not caused by the decision to continue trading, whatever the company's business and whenever the decision to cease trading ought to have been taken. In some cases that will no doubt be right, but it will clearly not be right in every case. Moreover, contrary to what Mr Sharma said in Parliament, the provision does not remove the threat of personal liability from directors if they continue to trade. As pointed out elsewhere in the debate, directors continue to owe their normal duties to the company. And in particular, as matters stand, the directors owe a duty to act in the best inter interests of creditors when they know or ought to know that the company is insolvent or more likely than not to become insolvent, as we saw recently from the Court of Appeal decision in BTI and Sequana. And that duty continues to apply throughout um, the relevant period. And, and finally, it's notable that the new provision does not remove liability for wrongful trading if the point of no return is passed during the relevant period. It just affects the quantum of any claim. It's therefore wrong to describe it as a temporary suspension of wrongful trading liability, as Mr Scully did. So what we have overall appears to be a provision which is largely window dressing. However, it does have the potential to create various problems. First of all, the provision doesn't apply only to companies who become technically insolvent during the relevant period. It applies to all companies whenever the decision to cease trading should have been taken, even if they ought to have ceased trading sometime before COVID-19 hit. 
So the second problem is the meaning of the words worsening of the financial position of the company or its creditors. Do those words mean the same as the test the court actually applies in determining quantum? Personally, I think it probably does, but the language here is very loose and there are bound to be arguments. And finally, given that companies are unlikely to, to produce balance sheets at the beginning and end of the relevant period, how easy is it going to be for the court to determine how much of any increase in net deficiency occurred in the relevant period? And who bears, bears the burden of proof on this point? This is particularly relevant to claims which rely on a point of no return, which predates COVID-19. It seems that the burden will probably fall on office holders, who will have to do the best they can with, with what will often be limited resources in the way of financial records. How much leeway the court allows office holders in cases mm -hmm. such as this remains to be seen. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ruben, uh, very much. Just got a few minutes for um, some questions and answers. People have very kindly um, and helpfully sent some questions in advance. Um, the first one I had um, from Simeon Gilchrist of Edwin Co. Uh, relates to um, the statutory demand provisions. He says, if a statutory demand has historically been seen as a less than polite request to pay, a demand with menace, what is to stop the demand being used and following a nil response and a disconnected petition petition being used without reference to the demand. Uh, Katie, I think that's probably one for you. Thanks, James. Well, the first thing to note is that the uh, legal status really is stripped from the statutory demand during the relevant period. So there's nothing to stop you serving a statutory demand during the relevant period, um, but there's nothing to be gained by using the prescribed form either. Um, yes, you cannot base a petition on that demand um, if it was served then. Um, as I see it, there's nothing to um, stop you presenting an unconnected petition, but you'd probably be basing it on the grounds that the company was unable to pay, in which case then you'd need to satisfy the conditions that I've already referred to. So you'd still have some difficulty. So it might, to perhaps the uninformed recipient of the statutory demand, have some practical effect in trying to cause them to make payment, but yeah. in terms of legal effect, really not very much. Okay, that's, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, there's a question Ruben and I had, um, just arising out of um, one of the points you made towards the end. And it also ties in with a point made by Lisa Britmill from Shoesmiths about the loose wording that's used. The financial position wording probably means that the same tests applied mainly whether there's a as the court supply in any way there's been an increase in net deficiency. What, what, what do you think underlies that? Well, I, I think that the reference to worsening of the financial position of the company is an attempt to capture the increase in net deficiency test, uh, which is the, the standard test that um, Mr Justice Park explained was based on losses suffered by the company and not by the creditors. Um, but there is another um, potential basis of um, of assessment. Um, it, it was decided in uh, the case of Repurpoint that where the company's financial records are in such a poor state that it, you just can't recreate the financial position at an earlier date for the purposes of calculating estimated net deficiency, um, you can use the increase in creditor claims um, as uh, an alternative basis for calculating the um, the, the appropriate contribution by the defaulting director. So I, I think the reference to worsening of the financial position of the creditors is probably going to be construed as an attempt to capture that basis of calculation. Um, so covering off both, um, both existing um, alternative bases uh, as they stand at the moment. Okay, Ruben, yeah, I may understand that. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I had another uh, question in from um, Sunhill Mahindra from Slater Helis. Again, back to the uh, statutory demands and winding up provision. So probably one for you, Katie. Um, he asked for clarification whether uh, during the current situation, statutory demands followed by bankruptcy or insolvency proceedings against companies can still be used in respect of guarantors of leases and debts unrelated to leases and landlord tenant issues. Um, okay, I can deal with this one quite succinctly. The bill doesn't um, legislate in respect of personal insolvency, 
Um, so there's no bans on statutory demands in respect of bankruptcy. And the bill itself doesn't discriminate um, as to the nature of the debt. So whether the debt relates to um, a lease or not um, is irrelevant, really. So it shouldn't um, provide much of an issue once this relevant period is over. But of course, there is a risk that the relevant period might be extended. Yeah. And then actually, Sunhill touched on the question of in individual insolvency, personal insolvency, mm. as did David Sullivan of Evershed Sutherland. Uh, and he, they basically asked the question whether the legislation in relation to uh, corporates is going to influence the court in any respect in relation to individual insolvency, in particular um, bankruptcy petitions. I don't know if you, Ruben, have got any, any thoughts about that? Um, I'm happy to go first, or Ruben, do you want to? Uh, I'm, I'm happy. I mean, I, I think there are, there are two, uh, two parts to this. The first is um, whether it will influence them to, um, to treat bankruptcy positions in the same way as they treat, um, uh, treat corporate petitions. And I think the answer to that is no, because they, they can't simply dismiss um, uh, on the grounds that a corporate petition wouldn't have been permitted. Um, but you know, bankruptcy judges, uh, in my experience, tend to want to give debtors as much opportunity as possible to settle the debts um, rather than making them bankrupt um, if they can, if there's a reasonable prospect that they'll be able to do that. I suspect in present circumstances, um, they will be, uh, they'll be guided by the fact that, um, that there are lots of temporary um, temporary suspensions of payment around, um, there is um, lots of temporary pain, uh, which people are hoping will not turn into permanent pain. And um, so they are, I think, likely to take a more indulgent approach to debtors than they might otherwise do. Yes, yeah, so if you, you turn up as a debtor, um, in relation to debt associated with your business, and you say you've been affected by COVID, you can expect a reasonably sympathetic hearing to the adjournment of the petition for perhaps a considerable period of time, an opportunity to pay. I, I think so, yes. Okay, that's really helpful. I think looking at the time, we'll probably move on then from the Q&A um, section in relation to those topics. Uh, and I'll move then to um, Lauren uh, to start in relation to the supplier provisions. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, James. Uh, afternoon, everyone. I, as James says, I'm going to move on to the supply contracts uh, provisions in the bill. Uh, and I'll just give you a very quick nutshell overview of what those provisions are. Um, the section of the bill that we're talking about here applies to any contract for the supply, uh, as, the, as the title would suggest, the supply of goods or services. Um, there are some exceptions, but I'll, I'll come on to those shortly. Essentially, um, these provisions prohibit uh, termination clauses being relied upon, um, which are engaged on entering an insolvency procedure. Um, and what it does is essentially prevents suppliers from ceasing their supply or asking for additional payments, which includes pre-insolvency debts, uh, while a company is going through a rescue process. Um, the policy intention is clear here. It's to maximise rescue and sale opportunities for struggling companies, but also to help them trade through restructuring and insolvency processes. This works by inserting a new section 233B into the Insolvency Act. Um, as I say, it applies where a company becomes subject to what the bill calls a relevant insolvency procedure. And um, that includes the new moratorium um, and uh, the, also the new restructuring plan procedure, um, but it also includes the, the usual suspects, voluntary arrangements, uh, administration, liquidation. Uh, the, the, the bill works um, in the following way. A provision of a contract uh, for the supply of goods or services to the company ceases to have effect um, if, uh, when a company becomes subject to a relevant insolvency procedure, the, the contract or supply would terminate or any other thing would take place or the supplier would be entitled to terminate the contract or to do any other thing. Uh, and those are the exact words of the, of the section. So you, you will see they are very broadly worded. 
Uh, further provisions um, that it's worth being aware of, uh, a supplier cannot require pre-insolvency debts to be paid as a condition of making further supplies. Um, so that's a further restriction on, on what suppliers can do as a result of, uh, of this, what will be legislation. Uh, it's not a blanket ban uh, on termination clauses being relied upon, um, but there are three very specific circumstances envisaged. The first is uh, if there's an office holder, the office holder consents. Uh, the second is if there's no office holder, the company consents. Uh, the third is, is if the court is satisfied uh, that to continue the supply would cause the supplier hardship. Uh, and I know Matt's going to talk a little bit about um, some of the potential pitfalls with the word hardship being used. There are some exclusions, uh, as I outlined at the beginning. Uh, there's one temporary exclusion, uh, which is for uh, what the bill terms small suppliers. Um, I say temporary, it's going to last for a month um, from whenever the section comes into force. Uh, so it is very uh, short lived. Uh, and there are certain conditions which a company needs to meet, a supplier needs to meet um, to, to be considered a small supplier. Um, they include a turnover of, of less than 10.2 million, a uh, balance sheet of, of less than 5 million, uh, and a, a number of employees of, of not more than 50. So uh, those are the three conditions, and you have to meet two of those to be considered small. Um, there's also a much broader exception or exclusion uh, and that's for essentially uh, those involved in financial services so uh, also insurers but banks um, electronic, mon electronic money institutions um, generally uh, people involved in the organizations involved in the provision of financial services uh, and contracts which are financial contracts um, and there are various things envisaged in the legislation including um, swap agreements spot contracts those kinds of things uh, as the name suggests, 233B comes after 233A. Um, that is already in uh, the legislation, was introduced in 2015. Uh, it offers similar protections, uh, but only in relation to essential supplies. So that's utilities uh, and communication services. Um, it applies only where the company enters administration or CVA, so not any of the other types of insolvency procedure. Um, and 233B doesn't have any impact on 233A, it continues to have effect. Um, it's interesting to, to compare the two um, because 233B is a lot broader um, and that's probably characteristic of the, the government's general approach uh, in relation to all of these uh, provisions. They clearly want them to catch as many uh, companies as possible. Um, but it includes a, a, a much broader class of insolvency events as well as applying to a much broader class of contracts. Um, aside from those differences, they're worded fairly similarly in terms of their effect um, and have the same conditions for termination, uh, for permitting termination, uh, i.e. consent or the permission of the court. Um, a key difference, uh, in addition to the, the broadness of 233B, under 233A, office holders are required to provide personal guarantees in respect of the payment of charges uh, relating to the continuation of the supply. There's no such uh, requirement at all under 233B, and that's likely to have a very significant impact uh, and, and be a significant difference between the two. Uh, that was a very uh, whistle-stop tour through those provisions. Um, I think I'll, I'll hand back to James. Uh, it's actually Chris. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, delegates, for getting us completely mixed yeah. up. This is the problem. The risk with having a co-host is that you don't know which one's going to do the next bit. <laughs> Never mind. Never I'll mind. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Lauren. Thank you, anyway. Um, up to that point, it was perfect. <laughs> Can I now ask Matt to do his bit? If you could unmute. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Um, this is a, a very short um, talk through what I've identified and what I think other people have probably identified as some of the potential pitfalls uh, in the legislation that's being uh, put through Parliament at the moment. Um, I split it up into four topics, which you'll see from the slides, uncertainties in the bill, exceptions to it, problems for suppliers and issues for the company. Exceptions have really been covered by Lauren, so I'm going to fly over that. Uh, for the purposes of speed. If we start with uncertainties in the provisions, the bill is designed, the government say, to provide protection for companies in distress by safeguarding the supply of goods and services in order to promote rescue. 
But there are some current drafting issues which raise obvious questions. The first of those is what is hardship for the purposes of uh, subsection 5C? Um, are the courts going to be looking for simply temporary financial difficulty to the supplier? Will there be a requirement for some permanent long-term damage? The government's fact sheets that provide some guidance um, simply refer to a supplier being able to avail themselves of this exception if its own solvency is threatened. Well, um, that may well end up being the test, but is it only if their solvency is threatened? What if they're already insolvent? Many suppliers in the current climate may already be insolvent, so frankly the threat to their solvency is long gone. Um, does it mean a threat of formal insolvency or simply uh, not being able to pay debts as and when they fall due? The sort of questions that are obvious are what on earth is the supplier going to be expected to have to show? The difficulty of course is that if it's simply that it'll cause a cash flow problem for the supplier, pretty much every supplier I would have thought is going to fall into that category, so it rather renders this exception um, a little bit too wide. But if it's more than that, how much more and what sort of level of evidence is, is likely to be expected? So utterly unclear and I would have thought um, grounds for argument for a, a number of months to come. Um, the other question on hardship is, is it hardship alone that's sufficient to trigger subsection 5C? The wording says it provides for termination if the court is satisfied as to hardship and grants permission for the termination of the contract. Now, one reading of that suggests that there will remain, therefore, an element of discretion for the court. So hardship may only be a gateway into this provision. The court will still have to decide whether to exercise its discretion to allow the supplier to terminate the contract. If that's the case, the obvious follow-up question is, well, how are they going to exercise that discretion? It could be that they're going to apply a re-Atlantic computer systems type balancing exercise that you have for lifting the moratorium in administrations, but that may be too onerous. It may not be what's intended. Uh, we simply don't know at this stage. So again, how the courts exercise their discretion to terminate is going to be an issue that um, will only become apparent once it starts doing it. Um, the other uncertainty the bill provides in the drafting is it applies to cover contracts for the supply of goods or services. Obvious question, well, what does that cover? There's no definition of that within the legislation as it currently sits, so nothing that we can base within uh, the bill itself. Is that going to be defined narrowly? Is it broadly? The obvious um, anomalies, one might think, are what about a franchise agreement? Does that fit within what might be considered a supply of goods or services? It's not immediately obvious that it does. What about a license? A license to use brand names, intellectual property, that sort of thing. Does that immediately fall within the definition? It's not clear that it does, but you can see that if you're running a franchise business that goes into one of these insolvency procedures, if your franchise agreement is terminated or your license is terminated, uh, promoting rescue is not going to be very easy. Uh, there, are, there is, of course, Section 233C, which allows the Secretary of State to amend the legislation, and it may be that um, some patching ups of holes has to be done after the event. As I say, exceptions been dealt with Lauren, so I won't spend any time uh, dealing with this, but you have the slide. Problems for suppliers. I imagine most of you will have thought of these. Um, essentially, the, the fundamental interesting point of this is you're forcing suppliers to supply failing businesses. And that interferes uh, with the contractual arrangement negotiated between the parties. It, it stands to reason that when the parties negotiated these contracts, one of the provisions that was inserted was an ability to terminate on insolvency. And that may be said that if you start interfering with that, you're essentially interfering with the negotiations between the parties and creating a position that wasn't ever intended. Um, as Lauren mentioned, another issue, well, there's no requirement for a personal guarantee from any office holder, unlike essential suppliers. So that potentially creates exposure for the supplier. And that's made worse for a supplier potentially, because of course, it's not just termination that's prohibited by these provisions. It's any other thing, as Lauren said. Well, what's any other thing? One assumes you can't change the payment terms. So insolvency doesn't allow you, for instance, to ask for payment on delivery, as you might otherwise do. You can't change credit periods. 
So depending on the nature of your contract, depending on the relationship between the parties, it may well be that this particular business was given a long line of credit under the contract. Now that it's gone into some formal insolvency procedure, that has to remain the case. And so the supplier could be waiting a long time to receive any money under this. And of course, they're not guaranteed to receive anything anyway if the insolvency procedure doesn't work. Um, of course, there may be less exposure if uh, that supply is considered to be an expense of an administration, for instance, but that's um, unlikely to cover a lot of situations that creep up, so isn't going to give every supplier any sort of protection. Um, it may also create um, leverage for office holders. There's potential, I suspect, for office holders to say, well, you can't stop supplying us, but how about therefore we have a discussion about on what terms you're now going to supply us so that the company gets a better deal. Um, there's no obligation on anybody to accept those new terms, but of course, if a supplier knows that he can't simply stop supplying, that ability to e exercise leverage is gone. It may well be that this is a, a, a poor deal for suppliers in due course. And of course, the small entity exception at the moment looks as though it's going to last about a month. So there really isn't a great exception for small entities. So after that period, small entities are in the firing line and you would have thought that small entities are going to be the ones that suffer much more than multinationals in this sort of um, obliged supply under contract. Um, and finally, issues for the company. Uh, and this is really, I think, the law of unintended consequences. Is this going to work? The intention is to um, prevent suppliers jeopardizing attempts to rescue the business. Sounds great. But if you're excluding any financial contracts and non-goods and services contracts don't come within these provisions, are you actually assisting rescue of business? You're forcing certain suppliers to supply goods to a trading business, which as a matter of policy is, is fine as far as it goes. But what happens to the business if the bank terminates the overdraft or calls in a loan or terminates a, a factoring agreement, an invoice discounting agreement? What about if the leases on any machinery are terminated or insurance is canceled or a franchise agreement is terminated? These are all things that on the face of it aren't prohibited by 233B and yet will cause a, a catastrophic effect on any business and therefore uh, rescue culture or not, simply forcing these suppliers to supply is unlikely to be the answer. Um, also, what happens before the insolvency? What effect will this have on suppliers? Well, I would have thought it's entirely possible that suppliers become far quicker to terminate pre-insolvency to avoid being caught by 233B. They're less likely to give leeway to struggling businesses because if you're a supplier on the edge, why would you? Why wouldn't you simply terminate immediately that there's a problem so that you don't end up having to supply to a business um, with a risk of not being paid? You're probably less likely to waive breaches and treat them far more seriously. So actually the effect on businesses and companies receiving those supplies is likely to be less advantageous than the current situation. What about the terms of supply contracts? Are we going to see redrafting of terms and conditions where late payments become an automatic termination event? So rather than allowing any period to remedy late payments, as is often the case now, it simply cuts the agreement off at the knees and the business suffers. Will it be automatic to avoid having to deal with this? Um, the other point as a matter of practice is that if agreements as they're currently drafted allow termination upon insolvency, so not just a relevant procedure but insolvency itself, in some instances suppliers are going to get advance warning of any insolvency procedure. They're going to receive CVA proposals for instance. They may well receive notice of a winding up petition or they'll see something within the press about um, certain retailers for instance considering their position and speaking to IPs. Well all of that gives um, suppliers a heads up and allows them to act now to avoid being caught. Well, that isn't promoting rescue either. Also, will suppliers be less likely to enter into contracts without personal guarantees? You may find now that if you're a director of a company requiring supplies, you're going to be asked for personal guarantees for every supply contract that's entered into because that and or security over the assets is going to be the quid pro quo for suppliers that now face the prospect of having to supply through insolvency. And finally, um, what um, will suppliers change the way they contract with businesses? Because um, it seems to me that if you've got a long-term supply contract, you run the risk if you're 
customer goes into insolvency of having to continue to supply, what's the obvious answer for that? Well, you may well enter into a number of much shorter contracts so that in fact, your liability to supply within insolvency is curtailed and you're protecting your position. Well, that doesn't help businesses. It's not going to reinforce security of supply and it's going to make their position more precarious, which clearly isn't the design of these provisions. So they're just a few things that occur to me as being potential problems when these provisions come into force and people are actually relying on them and trying to use them. Chris. Thanks, Matt. And in terms of the questions, so just picking up on the point that uh, you've just been making, uh, we've got a question, advanced question here from Paul. To what extent will the new provision stop suppliers who do not have overarching longer contracts, but who just supply on single purchase order and delivery basis? On what basis will they be able to refuse future orders or deliveries? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Well, I think that's an excellent point. It goes to the heart of the problem this may create. If you're acting under a framework agreement and each individual purchase and order is a separate contract, nothing in these provisions force you to contract with the business. What they stop you doing is terminating any existing contract to supply. And so if each delivery and each order is a separate contract, if you're the supplier and you don't want to do it, you simply refuse to enter into any further contract. So um, that is a obvious problem and an obvious loophole. But as I mentioned a moment ago, I think Paul Meadows is quite right. The risk is that that then becomes um, much more of a template for other suppliers who see the opportunity to structure their business that way going forward and avoid the consequences of this. So yeah, it, it, that is a real issue for uh, companies in insolvency procedures and, and a way in which suppliers may well look to get around these provisions. Lauren, have you got anything to add to that? Only that the, the long-term impact, well, clearly unintended, uh, is something to keep an eye on because if, if suppliers decide to move away, typically, um, from longer-term contracts and towards these purchase order type approaches, um, then you might actually see, again, um, a, 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 a shift in the way um, that relationship works, um, which, which may uh, have, have long-term unintended consequences. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree with all those points. Uh, and I think this is highlights one of the problems with these provisions. The bill is being rushed through without an awful lot of consideration as to how this particular provision, which might on its own be very sensible, how it's going to fit in with other sorts of contracts. Um, I mean, where you've got a situation where you've got an umbrella agreement with standard terms, that may well be now the default way of contracting because you can then refuse any order you, um, you don't like. Um, following an insolvency because there's no obligation to enter into it but you've got your sort of standard terms and the contractual arrangements already set up so uh, and another thing which Matt touched on but I think it's worth highlighting again it's about the definition of the relevant period um, it's an obvious uh, loophole isn't it that if you define something by reference to the entry into um, uh, insolvency so that is to say a company actually going into liquidation or actually going into administration, that people are going to act immediately before that. I mean, contrast the provisions, for example, on uh, set offs or um, preferences, things like that, where there are, you know, to be acting in good faith, there are definitions re by reference to whether the petitions be presented or whether you've got notice of something about to happen. No, none of that's in there. So you've got this, it's a very clunky, awkward kind of, um, uh, of, 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 of test, which you have to, nothing happens until the, it's all really after the event. And I mean, it really makes these clauses, I think, you know, whilst they're good intentioned, I think it's going to make them uh, of relatively limited application in, in the real world. Yeah. Okay. Um, now we've had a question in, which I think is quite close to some of um, our attendees' hearts. Laura, I'm going to ask, it's directed to you, so I'm going to ask you to answer this. Um, a concern here is that a solicitor contracts with a company client to provide services, advice, etc. And the company can presumably use this provision to prevent the solicitor suspending its services upon non-payment of a bill. And we all have experience of that. Lauren. Yeah, sadly we do. Thank you, uh, Paul, for the question. Um, you're right, it's entirely possible that those types of contracts fall within this. There's no reason to think that they'd be treated any differently. They're contracts for the supply of services, and as we know, the legislation includes services as well as goods supply contracts. Um, it's worth noting, however, that the, the, 
provisions that we're talking about apply to breaches um, which occur before the insolvency procedure was entered into, but not to breaches which occur after the insolvency procedure is entered into. Um, so you, you can still rely on your termination clauses uh, in those scenarios. So some, uh, some comfort there that if you're effectively being forced to continue to supply advice or, or whatever uh, services are included within that contract, um, if, if, if non-payment continues after the insolvency procedure has commenced or has been entered into, um, then the termination clauses can still be used. Indeed, if, if only uh, the lobby for solicitors was as powerful as the lobby for banks, eh? Uh, uh, that maybe uh, there'd be a special exception for solicitors as well. Oh, uh, but uh, what, what this highlights, of course, sorry, who was going to say something? Sorry, Matt. It, it was Matt, just on that point, uh, just picking up from where Lauren said, I, I look forward to the first solicitors firm making an application that it qualifies under the hardship provision so it doesn't have supply <laughs> services. <laughs> okay, well, uh, I won't try and follow that. <laughs> I've got a supplemental question which I'd like to ask, and I think I'm going to ask both of you to answer, address this. It touches on the point that I just made about um, the lobby, uh, the lobby for financial services and banks in this case, which seems to permeate this bill uh, in, a, in a negative way to my mind, but one understands the commerciality of it, but it does highlight the special position being given to banks and others involved in financial services. The question is this. Does the exclusion of banks and other financial services providers create a two-tier system? And how is this consistent with the pari passu principle, which is supposed to be fundamental to our insolvency law? Lauren. Yeah, um, well, it, uh, it does create a two-tier system. And, and, and what struck me about this is that it really flies in the face of what the government said at the outset of this crisis, which was we've learned from 2008 when we just helped the banks and we forgot about companies and individuals. Um, and we're going to, we're, we've learned the lessons of 2008 and, and we're not going to prioritize the banks uh, over people um, and their companies, their businesses. And that's exactly what this does. Um, it, it's pretty stark uh, to read the, the list of exclusions, exceptions, because it's all, it's all banks, financial services providers. Um, I suspect, again, caused by um, what you alluded to, Chris, lobbying of, of those kinds of organisations and their influence on government, um, it's impossible to know. But, but very clearly what it does create is, is as you say, a two-tier system, um, which it, it results in unfair differences between different classes of creditor. Matt? Yeah, uh, I think Lauren's spot on. And actually, um, if I was being really cynical and unfair, it probably creates more than a two-tier system. Certainly within unsecured creditors, what have you got? You've probably got a potentially a four-tier system because you've got um, banks on the one hand, you've got suppliers that are caught by 233B, you've got ordinary suppliers that are not caught by 233B, and you've got essential supplies under 233A. So you've got four different categories there of unsecured creditor, all being treated in sometimes radically different ways. And Chris, as you pointed out in the question, that's not what the principle of pari passu is all about. And that's not what our insolvency procedures and regimes were based on in, in the beginning. So it is a, a radical shift now towards treating different classes of creditors in very different ways. Um, I think one of the problems here is that um, I don't recall when I read all of the consultation um, documentation that there was any indication that the banks were going to be excluded from these provisions. Um, I don't know quite how uh, uh, the, the bill has been drafted in the way that it has, but clearly some things happened between the time of the consultation and the time of the drafting of the bill. And, and it's not as if um, government is not aware of the problem. Um, I mean, the idea is that this is supposed to help the small guy, right? Um, certainly words to that effect uh, were expressed in the debate and the, in the House of Commons in the second reading. Uh, and, and that's recognized in the fact that we have an exclusion for um, small businesses but, but um, the exclusion is for such a small period of time, it's not going to have any major impact. And this, is a, this isn't a temporary COVID provision. This is a, this is a permanent provision. Um, and I really do think that um, uh, when the dust starts to settle, um, perhaps although the government didn't have any plans to use this 
amendment provision um, that's open now until, what is it, June uh, or April of next year, perhaps it's not going to be long before it realises it needs to make some amendments to, to actually make these um, um, clauses operate uh, in a slightly fairer way. Um, and one of the things that came out of uh, last week's um, presentations was the fact that, that banks um, may well be giving, getting a very good advantage in the moratorium provisions because they're getting a priority um, in respect of debts that um, fall due during the course of the, of the moratorium. Now, if they're not prevented from accelerating their loans or, other, or otherwise uh, in, uh, uh, incurring or triggering clauses which incur large charges of which we know much about, then all of those uh, debts are going to potentially become preferential in the insolvency. And so what you're, going to, what you're going to do is you're going to actually undermine the return to a lot of creditors in that way. But now that all remains to be seen. Um, and we all need to think about the precise wording of this bill, because I think in some respects, particularly the, the, the drafting of the moratorium provision, um, it leaves a lot to be desired. Anyway, that's enough, um, I think, for the moment. James, uh, I'm going to hand over to you now. Yes, uh, thanks, Chris. Well, we're pretty much up for time. Um, I mean, it seems to be that one can well understand why the government wished to be seen to be doing things to help businesses in this exceptional time. The issues we've covered over the last two weeks show that there are real significant legal and practical issues for us to work through over the coming weeks, uh, months, and indeed probably years. And whether in, a, in practical terms they actually uh, help uh, distressed businesses really does uh, remain to be seen. Um, but anyway, I'd like to um, thank the speakers for getting through a lot of material um, so efficiently. Uh, thank you, the audience, for joining us and for participating. Uh, I look forward to seeing you all soon, hopefully face-to-face, uh, -face, at least at some point in the future. All right, thanks very much. Bye-bye.